Let us have a detailed look at the various mastoid SLs and mastoid pneumatization. The mastoid SL system represents a more or less extensive system of interconnecting air filled cavities arising from the walls of the mastoid antrum and walls of the middle ear. In 1969, Alum classified the pneumatized spaces of the temporal bone into five different regions. They are the middle ear region, the mastoid region, the perilabyrinthine region, the petrous apex region and the accessory regions. This air cell system is lined by flattened non-seriated squamous epithelium. Ventilation of the middle ear is an essential predictor of the functional results following middle ear reconstruction. The role of mastoid pneumatization in the middle ear aeration is not exactly known, but it forms an air reservoir and acts as a surge tank to minimize pressure fluctuation. The exact mechanism of the pneumatization of the mastoid SL system and the factors influencing the pneumatization are poorly understood. The pneumatization has been linked to hereditary and genetic factors. It has also been related to the size of the skull. That is the extensive area where the mastoid essence are located and we here now have a clear picture after extensive cortical mastoidectomy. The limits of which are the dural plate the sinus plate and the posterior superior bony meatal wall and in between are the extensive aerated mastoid SLs. Pneumatization of the temporary bone follows definite cell tracts. These cell tracts are posterior superior cell tract, the posterior medial cell tract, the subarcuate cell tract, perilabyrinthine cell tract, peri tubal cell tract and these tracts communicate with each other. The posterior superior and posterior medial cell tract. These tracts extend medially through the antrum to pneumatize the medial pyramid. The posterior superior tract lies at the level of above the level of the internal acoustic meatus. That shows the three regions of the temporary bone, the mastoid region, the perilabyrinthine region and the petrous apex region. And this is the posterior superior and the posterior medial tract. The subarcuate tract. This arises more medially from the mastoid antrum, extends anteromedially, passes below the superior semicircular canal. This tract often participates in the formation of the posterior superior tract and may pneumatize the petrous apex. This is to be emphasized that the subarcuate tract passes below the superior semicircular canal. That shows the subarcuate tract passing below the superior semicircular canal. Perilabyrinthine cell tract. This tract pneumatizes the labyrinthine area. It divides into a supralabyrinthine and an infralabyrinthine tract. Peritubal cell tract. This pneumatizes the tubal and the peritubal. Functions of the temporal bone air cells. Number 1. Sound reception, resonance, insulation, supplementary air reservoir, sound dissipation and lightening the weight of the skull and finally protection against injury. The pneumatization of mastoid region is of three types. Sclerotic mastoid which is absent pneumatization. The non-pneumatized portion is covered with dense bone. Diploic mastoid partial pneumatization. The non-pneumatized area is filled with bone marrow. Pneumatic mastoid where there is complete pneumatization. 
process of nematization begins between 22 to 24 weeks of fetal life and continues till the child reaches the age of 8. The development of air cavities begin with the formation of bony cavities. This process is dependent on normal periosteal activity and this cavity is known to contain primitive bone marrow. This bone marrow gets transformed into loose mesenchymal connective tissue and the cavity gets invaded by mucosa from the medullary cavity. Areas of temporal bone that are normally pneumatized include the medullary, namely epitympanum, mesotympanum and hypotympanum. Squamous mastoid area, namely the antrum, central mastoid tract and the peripheral cells. Perilabyrinthine, namely the supralabyrinthine and the infralabyrinthine cells. Petrous apex, which includes the petrosal cells and the apical cells. And finally, the accessory cells, which include the zygomatic cells, occipital cells, squamous cells and the styloid cells. That shows the pneumatic spaces of the mastoid air cell system. The temporal bone pneumatization is symmetrical in 75% of normal individuals. Any asymmetrical pneumatization indicates middlear disease. Mastoid pneumatization can fail due to various causes leading to the formation of a sclerosis mastoid. Various theories have been proposed to account for this failure of the pneumatization process. These theories include the Wittmark's theory. This theory is otherwise known as the endodermal theory. This was first proposed by Wittmark who believed normal middleia mucosa is a must for normal pneumatization to proceed. In the presence of infantile otitis media, the pneumatization of the temporal bone may get arrested causing a failure of the process of pneumatization. Infantile otitis media is common in premature infants due to meconium soiling of the middleia cavity. Tumarkin's theory. This theory proposed by Tumarkin states that failure of pneumatization can occur due to failure of middleware aeration due to eustachian tube dysfunction. Diamond and Dahlberg suggested that dense bone is congenital and is a normal anatomical variant. Ikarashi proved that long lasting inflammation increases bone mass thereby preventing normal pneumatization. Factors determining the middleware pressure. They are ventilation from eustachian tube, passing of gases into circulation by diffusion, thickness of the middleware mucosa, elasticity of the tympanic membrane, size of mastoid pneumatization and we will now have a look at the mastoid acid system. This is considered to be an important contributor to the physiology of middle ear function. According to Tumakin, the mastoid air cell system served as a reservoir of air and serves as a buffer system to replace air in the middle ear space, temporarily in case of eustachian tube dysfunction. The mean volume of air in the mastoid air cell system could be about 5 to 8 milliliters. CT scan evaluation of temporary bone is considered to be the best modality to access mastoid air cell system. The pneumatization of mastoid air cell system can be divided into three types. Sclerotic mastoid wherein the pneumatization is absent, diploic mastoid where there is partial pneumatization and a pneumatic mastoid where there is a full and complete pneumatization. The mastoid air cell system is covered with a highly vascular cuboidal epithelium. The contact between blood vessels and the basement membrane is rather close resembling that of alveoli where extensive gases exchange takes place. The mastoid acid system is categorized according to various regions of the temporal bone and these include squamomastoid. This area includes air cells around the antrum, central mastoid tract and peripheral air cell tract. Perilabyrinthine cells. These can be divided into a supralabyrinthine and an infralabyrinthine air cells. Petrosal air cells which include the petrosal air cells and the petrous apex air cells. And finally, the accessory air cells. These cells include zygomatic air cells 
occipital air cells, squamous air cells and the styloid air cells. These are different systems of mastoid air cell categorizations. Patients with poor nematization of the mastoid air cell system are more prone to develop adhesive otitis media following midlayer infections as the normal buffering system of the mastoid nematization is not adequate in them. Treatment of secretory otitis media with effusion is more effective in a patient with a well-developed mastoid air cell system when compared to that of patients with sclerosed mastoids. This x-ray shows lateral view of the skull showing the mastoid air cell complex. That is the mastoid air cell complex communicating with the midlia via the mastoid editus to the antrum. The mastoid antrum which is a single large air cell behind the epitympanic area communicates with it via the editus that is the editus through which the antrum communicates with the epitympanic space. The entrance to the antrum is a large irregular aperture which leads backwards from the epitympanic recess into the air space named the tympanic or the mastoid antrum. The antrum communicates behind and below with the mastoid air cells which vary considerably in number, size and form. The antrum and mastoid air cells are lined by mucous membrane continuous with that lining the tympanic membrane. Again, this shows the communication with the mid of the midlayer space through the mastoid additus to the mastoid antrum. I repeat again, communication of the midlayer space from the epitympanum via the additus into the antrum and thereafter the mastoid air cell system. With any type of mastoid, mastoid antrum is always present. In sclerotic mastoids, the antrum is usually small. Depending on the location, mastoid air cells are divided into number one, tip cells near the mastoid tip. They are large and lie medial and lateral to the digastric ridge. Therefore, we have a medial tip cell and a lateral tip cell. Perisinus cells that oval lie the sigmoid sinus split. The zygomatic cells which are in the root of the zygoma, the tegment cells extending into the tegment tympani, the retrofacial cells which are located behind the facial nerve, the perilabyrinthine cells located above and behind the labyrinth, the peritubal cells around the eustachian tube, and the marginal cells lying behind the sinus plate may extend to the occipital bone. Squamous cells may also be present lying on the squamous part of the temporary bone. Let us have a look at these defined cell groups. They are the tip cells, the perisinus cells, the retrofacial cells, the zygomatic cells, the peritubal cells, the sinodural cells, the squamosal cells and the petrous apex cells and the periantral cells. The mastoid develops from squamous and petrous part of the temporary bone. The petrosquamosal suture therefore may persist as a bony septum. This is called the corner septum separating the superficial squamosal cells from the deep petrosal cells. Corner septum therefore may cause difficulty in locating the underlying cells leading to incomplete removal of disease. The mastoid antrum cannot be reached unless the corner septum if present is removed. This picture shows the presence of a corner septum separating the squamosal from the petrosal cells and unless this is removed the deeper underlying cells may not be removed resulting in residual disease. The mastoid antrum. It is the largest mastoid air cell seen in the petrous part of the temporary bone. Its dimensions are 14 into 9 into 7 millimeters. Its volume is about 1 millimeter and it is 15 millimeter deep 
in the adults the relationship relations of the mastoid antrum are superiorly it is related to the middle cranial fossa and the temporal lobe of brain inferiorly related to the digastric muscle laterally to the supramatic triangle of the mesiven triangle medially to the petrous temporal bone and posteriorly to the sigmoid sinus the surgical landmarks for mastoid antrum include the mesiven triangle the supramastoid crest where the mastoid antrum is posterior superior to it the simba concha which is surface marking the posterior prolongation of the root of the zygoma and the bone of the mastoid antrum which is more fenestrated than the rest let us have a look at how the mesiven triangle is drawn if this is the external artery canal that is the supra meatic crest or the supra mastoid crest this is the post superior bony meatal wall and a vertical tangent drawn tangent to the post superior bony wall and that is the mastoid antrum again the supra mastoid crest the post superior bony meatal wall a vertical tangent drawn tangent to the posterior border and the blue arrow points to the mesiven triangle that is the mesiven triangle the defined cells are the tip cells the perisynous cells the retrofacial cells the synodural cells the tegment cells the zygomatic cells and the central cortical cells the types of mastoids according to cellularity are of three types namely cellular sclerotic and diploic certain points in this presentation will be emphasized to absolutely make sure that the concept is well understood and this cellularity is of importance in mastoid surgeries let us now finally have a look at the various defined cells the medial tip cells and the lateral tip cells the perisynous cells the synodural cells the occipital axillary cells the tegment cells the squamous axillary cells the subarcuit cells passing below the superior semicircular canal the supralabyrinthine cells the infralabyrinthine cells the styloid cells the peritubular cells the retrofacial cells the mastoid antrum itself the central mastoid tract the zygomatic cells posterior superior cell tract and the posterior medial cell tract